This is Ben May, and I want to thank you for being with us as we together seek the old paths. In Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 16, we've often quoted this, but I think it's good to be reminded. Thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see, and ask for the old paths, where the good way is, and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. We're trying to get back to the old paths. And, and in keeping with that, we are studying from the Old Testament because we want to, to learn those valuable lessons that are there for our learning. In fact, the New Testament says that in Romans 15 and verse 4 that whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Now, in this lesson, we are coming now into a very uh, interesting time of the children of Israel, but also a very uh, turbulent time. It's the time known as the Judges. If you recall from our outline of the entire Bible, this is a new period of time. We, we said, well, there's before the flood or the creation stories. Before the flood, the flood, the scattering of the people, and the patriarchs. Those four times covered the book of Genesis. And then we went to the Exodus. And that's, as its name implies, it starts in the book of Exodus. But there's Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And then when we come to Joshua, we are coming into a, another category called the invasion and conquest of the land. And we observed and read and studied how Joshua, with God's, of course, uh, hand, went through the land of Canaan and conquered it and divided it among the tribes. Now, unfortunately, they didn't do what God had told them to do. God said, you drive everybody out. Don't leave any of the pagans there. Because if you do, they're going to be a snare to you. And we find that, uh, sure enough, as always, what God says is right and comes about. And we find that um, lived out in the book of Judges, in the period of time that we call the Judges. Now, after the Judges, we go to the time called the United Kingdom, then the Divided Kingdom, the Captivity, the Return, and then the Years of Silence, which is the time between the Old and the New Testament, and then we have the life of Christ, and then the, um, the life of Christ in the early church and letters to the Christians, and, and those are the 17 periods that we are endeavoring to go through. Now, going, coming back to Judges, now, and if, and if you have your study guide, let me encourage you to get that and turn to page 61, and we'll, we're going to cover pages 61 through page 68. And this will be the first four of the Judges. And this is from Judges chapter 3, verse 7, down to uh, chapter 5 through that, through verse 31. And we're going to see Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, and Deborah. And so I hope that, that you'll uh, take your Bible, be Judges chapter 3, if you don't have a study guide, or if you do, either way, if you have your Bible and a study guide, or one or the other, and uh, join us as we study together. Now, the, I said it was a turbulent time. You, you'll see this over and over. You'll see this scenario going back and forth. They'll be faithful, and then they won't be. And, you know, uh, and, and then God, uh, uh, the, the idea, let me, let me say this, the idea of the judges, uh, this is going to be the deliverer, we might better say, for our own terminology. And after he or she, in one case, delivered God's people from their enemy, then they would be the judge. They would be the, the one the people would go to to decide difficult cases and such, much like Moses did, and of course Joshua, as he succeeded him. And, and so we have this time of the judges, and again we have the first four. Now notice what God said in Judges chapter 2. Judges chapter 2 and starting at verse 2. God said, But you have not obeyed my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall be thorns in your sight, and their God shall be a snare to you. Sometimes people question God and wonder, Well, God, why are you letting your people suffer? And, and, and the children of Israel 
we see that especially when we come to the case of Gideon uh, in our next lesson. Wonder, well, God, why, why are your people suffering? Where are you? And, and yet God said, I told you. I told you that if you don't obey me and, and drive in your enemy out, they're going to be a snare to you. And so God said that he left some there that he might test his people. See, God could on his own have gotten rid of the enemy, but that's not what he wanted. He wanted his people to obey him, to have enough faith, confidence, trust in him that they would drive out the enemy, of course, with, with God's hand. And so we come to the first need then for a judge. The Bible says that Joshua died, the elders who served with Joshua died, and after that the people become unfaithful. And God allows some of the enemy they had left remaining in the land, perhaps some of the enemy that had moved back into the land as well, to oppress them. And so we have Othniel. His enemy now it has a long name. It's Cushan. Rishathim, and he's from Mesopotamia. Now, Mesopotamia would be the area from between the two great rivers of the Tigris and Euphrates, up in, in uh, modern-day Iraq. And so the, this enemy then comes from there, uh, sort of like if you remember our, our study back in uh, Abraham's day in the book of Genesis, when the, the kings from that same area come down and they take uh, the cities, one of which uh, where Lot was in Sodom. And uh, they came from this Mesopotamia area. And so they put Israel in bondage for eight years. But now God through Othniel is going to deliver them and they'll have peace for about 40 years. But what we find now um, in this period of time, that Israel is going to serve Baal and Asherah. Now, these are pagan gods. Now, we won't go into detail about them, but what they had to do, they had to do with fertility. Remember that they were closely tied to the land, either through agriculture or, or more commonly with the Israelites, with their flocks and their herds. And so uh, having... Uh, um, a lot of uh, offspring was very important, and for their crops to do well was very important. And the pagans believed these particular gods had to do with that. And whether or not the women miscarried, and whether or not the babies were healthy, and all of that was tied, they thought, the pagans thought, to these gods. And so the Israelites wanted the same things. They just put their trust in the wrong place. And so God, true to his word, gives them over to the king of Mesopotamia. And again, Cushim uh, Rishathim controlled Israel for eight years, and then Israel cries out to God. We see in this pattern a, another ingredient to it, and that is God does, just doesn't come down and get rid of the enemy again. He waits on his people to come to their senses to realize, hey, we, we better cry to God. Uh, you know, Baal and Ashworth here, they're, they're, they're not doing it for us. So we're going to go back to, to the God of Israel. They, they, they come around, they repent, we would say. And so God raises up Othniel. Now that name should ring a bell to us. Othniel was the nephew of Caleb. Othniel was the one that, that Caleb gave his daughter to because he took the city that he challenged him uh, to take and so on. And Othniel defeats the king from Mesopotamia that had come up against him. Now, not only does Othniel defeat this king, but now he's the judge. And now for 40 years they have peace. I think sometime, I know I do, I, I sort of forget that. I think about all the turbulent times and all these judges that they're going to have. And yet they have great periods of peace because they're following God. I think about our country. You know, how, how long do, do we ever go 40 years without some major um, conflict of some kind? Now, we've been blessed that it has not been on our soil. But our soldiers have been sent in harm's way much more often than, say, you know, every 40 years. And so they had peace now for 40 years. Now, we don't know a lot about uh, the details of the battle. We know Othniel won. But we don't know where it was fought. We know where the king was from, generally, the Mesopotamia area. We know that Othniel was from the tribe of Judah, which would be uh, uh, the southern part of Israel. And he was given land in the Negev from his uncle, again, and father-in-law, Caleb. 
the Negev means south, and that would be again the southern part. And the enemy is coming from the northern part. And yet God uses Othniel uh, to defeat this enemy. Here's a map that uh, reminds us now of where these areas are. You see Judah on the map. And uh, on the southern part, next to the Dead Sea. And then if uh, our map doesn't cover this area, but if you just go all the way north and take a right, and uh, that, that'd be over the, the, the direction of Mesopotamia. And so again, they have peace now for 40 years. But now we come to our second judge. This judge is named Ehud. And it's an interesting story behind Ehud. Now, his particular enemy is going to be uh, three groups of people. We've all heard these names before, the Moabites, the Ammonites, and the Amalekites. These are long-standing enemies of the children of Israel. In fact, the Amalekites were among the first ones Israel fought uh, down in, in the uh, Rephidim before they got to Mount Sinai, and they defeated them there. And now we find them in a much different location up further north, but they were a nomadic tribe, which is so it's not unusual. And so uh, these groups, the Moabites, Ammonites, Amalekites, they oppress Israel, put them in bondage for 18 years. But when Ehud wins the victory now, he, he, uh, there's peace for some 80 years. Again, how long have we been at peace for 80 years? Um, not very often, have we? Well, so Ehud, second judge. Well, the same pattern now is, is following. Um, the people remember Othniel. He defeats the enemy. They have peace for 40 years. Othniel dies. The people backslide, as we would say. And God allows these three, those three groups to, to oppress them. Well, Eglon now, he's the, the leader. He's the king of Moab. Evidently, uh, the, the uh, Amalekites and the Ammonites are in league with them. And so they together are controlling Israel. They have a vested interest in that. Israel had defeated all of them before, but through their sin now, God allows them to be defeated. But, but finally now, after 18 years of oppression, Israel cries out to God. You know, it only took them eight years, which you would think is, you know, why eight years? But after 18 years, they cry out to God, and God is going to use Ehud of the tribe of Benjamin. Now, interesting thing about these Benjamites will be seen in this story, and, and let's, uh, let's notice that, though, in just a couple of minutes. Now, what Israel had to do, when, when you say they are being oppressed, you know, they, they're not in charge anymore. And so the king would say, you've got to bring your money to me. You've got to pay taxes to me or tribute. And so Israel sent this by, to, to Eglon by way of Ehud. Now Ehud, he takes him a, a double-edged sword about a cubit long, the Bible says, which would be about 18 inches. And he straps it to his right thigh, which you would think would be awkward except for the fact that Ehud is left-handed. Now, normally, a right-handed person would strap his sword on the left side so he could reach over far. Well, Ehud is left-handed. He's a Benjamite. Many of the Benjamites were left-handed. Places in Scripture talk about they could take that left hand and take a sling and, you know, split a hair, that, that sort of thing. And so he does. He comes to the king. He gives his tribute to the king. And then it's like he's going back home, and then he stops and he comes back to the king and says, I've got a secret message. I've got a message from God for you. Well, King Eglin, he sends everybody out. He thinks, oh, that's, you know, they're very egotistical anyway. And he has a, spe a special message for me from God. Everybody, everybody leave us. And so they were left alone, the Bible says, in a, in a um, chamber, like a private chamber that was cool. And so in, Ju in Judges chapter 3 and verse 20, Then Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. So he arose from his seat. Then Ehud reached with his left hand, took the dagger from his right thigh, and thrust it into his belly. Even the hilt went in after the blade, and the fat closed over the blade, for he did not, know, he did not draw the dagger out of his belly, and his entrails came out. Pretty gruesome scene, wasn't it? Eglin was a very fat person. 
And uh, Ehud just literally buried his dagger into the king. Well, n now what? You know, what do you suppose would happen? Remember, the king has sent everyone out. And so Ehud, he leaves the room, he locks the door. Well, the servants were, were hesitant to enter because they're thinking he's taking care of his private needs. We'd say he's in the restroom. You know, he's gone to the bathroom. That's what they thought perhaps he was doing. The Bible has an, ex an interesting expression for that. It, called, it says he's covered his feet. And so after a while, though, it's like, well, you know, we've got to check on the king and embarrassed, I'm sure, to do that. But they finally go in, they unlock the door, and there their king is, dead on the floor. Well, in the meantime, Ehud has escaped back to Israel. And so in the hill country of Ephraim, he calls Israel together by blowing a trumpet. Remember, in our study back when uh, Moses received the law from God, there's mention of these trumpets, and they made trumpets. And they had a sound, that they had various sounds for assembling the people for war, and when they were wandering in the wilderness for moving from location to location. And so they blow the trumpets to gather the people together. So in Judges chapter 3 now, and verse 28, Then he said to them, Follow me, for the Lord has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. So they went down after him, seized the uh, forts of the Jordan leading to Moab, and did not allow anyone to cross over. And at that time they killed about 10,000 men of Moab. In said, uh, they were all stout men of valor, not a man escaped. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. Now that is a long time, isn't it? But, but uh, it, it happened because there was one man that God was with. He took action. He called the people together, and they, and they took uh, back control of their own land. And that brings us to our third judge. And his name is Shamgar. And, and I tell you, we just don't know much about Shamgar. We know his enemies were the Philistines. But we don't know um, if all of Israel was in bondage, how long they were in bondage, how long the peace lasted. There seems to be some overlap in these judges, as we talked about before. Um, the next judge, Deborah, will mention Shamgar. But you get the idea that... that um, that somehow Shamgar fits in there between Ehud and Deborah, but, but not as a uh, widespread, maybe, of a situation as with some of the others. And so we have uh, Shamgar mentioned in Judges chapter 3 and verse 3. It says, After him, after Ehud, uh, was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. Now, we don't know that he killed all 600 at one time, probably maybe over a period of time. An ox goad would be that stick they'd use to, to goad the, ox, uh, the oxen uh, with. And so he was a great, mighty uh, man of war, obviously. And God used him to, um, to uh, beat back the, this new enemy in, in the sense that, uh, that it seems that they had come back into the land. They, their home was on the Isle of Crete. They had tried it down in Egypt. They, they were not successful there. And so they come up the coastline, and they're settling in now on the coastline by the Mediterranean Sea. Now, had, had Israel done what God said, they, they would not have allowed that to happen. But they let them get a foothold there, and they're going to prove to be a very um, troublesome enemy for many generations to come. Now, the Philistines, uh, again, uh, this is the first mention of them as a major enemy, but they've been around since the days of Abraham. And uh, they were known as great warriors. In fact, remember when Israel fled uh, from, from Egypt, that God did not allow them to go up through the place where the Philistines were because they were not ready for that degree of warfare yet. But they were not even named as a threat, though, before Israel entered Canaan. And so there was some ebb and flow with the power of the Philistines, as was true with many of these tribes. Now, the Philistines, you think about who they were. They were the descendants of Ham. Remember who Ham was? Remember Noah and the flood? He had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was that middle son that the curse was pronounced upon. And uh, the Philistines were part 
of his descendants, as were the Egyptians and the Canaanites. Again, their primary home had been the Isle of Crete, and uh, probably their home, Isle of Crete, was invaded, and they migrated to Canaan. They are also listed among the nations God left to test Israel with. And, and going into a little detail, because they are important, and they won't be subdued until the days of King David. So I said there, there it's generations to come. And David is going to have many, many battles with the Philistines. Remember um, David and Goliath? Goliath was the champion of the Philistine army. So that brings us to our fourth judge. And this, this judge is unique. Now, there are unique characteristics about various judges, uh, like Samson, for instance, his great strength. But here is the only woman, Deborah. She's, again, the fourth judge. Her enemy is just said to be the Canaanites. Again, that term sometimes uh, applies to a specific tribe, sometimes generically to, to all the inhabitants of the land. Here are the Canaanites. They put Israel back in bondage for some 20 years. But now she's going to deliver them through, of course, God, and they'll be at peace for 40 years. Well, the same, the same cycle. Um, you had Othniel, you had Ehud, you had Shamgar. They defeat the enemies of the people. There's peace. And then that leader dies, and now they backslide, and they, and they go back to serving these false gods. They did evil, and God gave them over to Jabin, the king of Canaan. Now, he uh, lived up at Hazor. Now, if you find it in your mouth, in your study guide, you'll find Hazor is going to be up. Um, if you find the, the Dead Sea, the Jordan River runs between the Dead Sea and the Sea of Galilee. And if you look above the Sea of Galilee, there's a little lake up there. And you find that Lake uh, Huron, I believe. And, and you look sort of southwest of that lake, and you'll see Hazor. And so he's at the the northern part of, of the land of, um, of Israel. Deborah, not only was she a judge, but she's also said to be a prophetess. A prophetess would be one who by inspiration receives messages from God. She's married to a man named Lepidoth, and they live in the hill country of Ephraim. Now, Ephraim is not that far north as what we'll see uh, where Hazor is, but she lives in the hill country of Ephraim. Ephraim. And she sends a message to Barak that Jehovah has called him. Now, it's an uh, interesting relationship. You've got Deborah. She's, gonna, she's the judge. She's the leader. Barak is going to be the captain of her army. And so she's, she sends for him. And so in Judges chapter 4 and verse 6, it says, Has not the Lord God of Israel commanded, go and de deploy troops at Mount Tabor. Take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and of the sons of Zebulun. And against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitude at the river Kishon. And I will deliver him into your hand. What more assurance do you suppose could Barak need? Deborah says, you know, I want you to lead the way. You lead the army. Well, it seems like Barak wasn't quite as, as confident as Deborah. He says, I'll go, Deborah, if you'll go with me. Well, she says, okay, I'll go, but, but here's the condition, you might say. In Judges chapter 4 and verse 9, Deborah says this, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, there will be no glory for you in the journey you are taking. For the Lord will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Now, that, you know, I, I don't know all the ins and outs of their relationship. We just aren't told. But, but um, he goes, Barak goes, but he's not going to get the credit. Deborah will get the credit, the honor for the battle for winning. And then she says, now God is going to give Sisera into the hand of a woman. And I, it seems to me that could be looked at two ways. There's two women that entered the picture in the defeat of Sisera, uh, the leader of, of the uh, enemy's army. And we'll see that as the story goes. Let's, let's watch for the second woman now that's going to be key to Sisera, the captain of the army, the enemy army, key to his defeat. So, Barak, he gathers 10,000 men from Zebulun and Naphtali. 
and over to the tribe to the children of Israel. You look on your map and you'll see their territory. I'm not sure just why they're singled out. They're not necessarily in the middle of the, you know, uh, where uh, Hazar was. But his army went out for, uh, for battle from Kadesh. Now, if you look on your on your map, um, you can find uh, Issachar and, and uh, Zebulun and Naphtali and those tribes up toward the northern part. Um, Zebulun and Naphtali. Well, uh, let me correct what I said. Now, Hazar is in the territory of Naphtali. And Zebulun was right down uh, below him. And so they are called into battle. I mentioned before that learning, having an idea of where these tribes are located helps us to understand why various ones may be the ones called into battle. And so that's why uh, with that case. So um, Sisera, the, the leader of the enemy's army, goes out to meet Barak for battle. Deborah's already said, we're going to win, Barak. We're going to win. It doesn't matter about the forces of the of the army. We we will win. Well, Barak and his army destroyed Sisera's forces. Well, another interesting thing about this is that, that they had chariots of iron. The enemy, Sisera's army, had had uh, nine hundred chariots of iron, the most formidable weapon of war out in the field that there was in that day and time. But again, they're fighting against God. And evidently, there was a lot of rain. The, the uh, song that Deborah is going to write indicates that there was a lot of rain. The rivers were flooding. Well, those chariots in that boggy land were not doing, a whole, doing them a lot of good. And, and uh, Barak has his forces up on higher ground. And in fact, Sisera ends up leaving his chariot. Now, why would you leave a fast chariot to go on foot unless the chariot was having trouble moving? And so he, he runs. He flees to the tent of Heber, the Kenite. Now, the Bible makes mention about the Kenites, how they had separated themselves, uh, and they were down in the area of uh, the land of Judah, tribe, for the tribe of Judah. Remember the Kenites. They were the, the uh, in-laws of Moses. Heber's wife, Jael, offered Sisera drink and rest. Now, there was a treaty between the Kenites and between uh, the, the forces that Sisera was with, and Sisera just says, you watch for me now. Just keep an eye on things, you know. And, uh, and so he goes in, and, and she gives him some milk to drink, and he gets under the cover in the tent, and he goes deep into a sleep. And as he slept, Jael drove a tent peg through his temple and killed him. See, she was for God's people. Of course, Sisera didn't know that. So Israel defeated Sisera's and his forces that day. In time, they gained control over Jabin, the king of Canaan. We don't know if it was at one battle or a series of battles. And then Jabin was finally put to death also. He, he finally is caught up with, and he loses his life as well. And so under uh, the unique situation of you have a, a woman who is the judge, who is a prophetess, leads God's people in the battle. Of, of all the judges, this is the only woman. And what a wonderful leader she was. And so then we come to our next judge, and we will talk about him, Lord willing, next time. It's an interesting story about this judge. In fact, we'll only look at him uh, by himself because there's more told about him. His name is Gideon. And just some wonderful stories. I encourage you to take your study guide. And uh, it'll, it'll begin on page 68 of the study guide. And um, read that. And, and, of course, if you don't have a, a study guide, uh, just uh, look in your Bibles and start in Judges uh, chapter 6, and we'll cover from ch chapter 6 through chapter 8. And I think you'll enjoy learning more of the story of the Judge Gideon. Thank you for being with us. Invite somebody else to watch. Request a free copy of this program if you'd like, and we'll be happy to get that to you. Order your workbook. From the name, from the number, the email address that you'll see on your screen. We'll be happy to send it out to you free of charge. Thank you for being with us. Join us next time as we continue to seek the old past.